It is good to see you all here this morning, and it is a delight to be back, and thank you so much for your prayers while Luann and I were away. We enjoyed some good time with uh, family members, and that's always nice. Hebrews chapter 12 is where we are this morning, working our way through the book of Hebrews. And as you are finding it, I'm going to read those verses just to get them set in our minds a little bit. We'll actually be back to them just briefly next week because I'm sort of breaking the paragraph and the thought here. Um, I, I didn't feel like I could preach the whole first 11 verses in one sermon, so we'll, we'll start at it this week and then we'll get another running start at it and take a few more, more verses next week and we'll, we'll get it conquered. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Beloved, this is the infallible and inerrant word of God, and I pray that all of us will receive it this morning as such. You remember the book of Hebrews, seems obvious, was written to the Jewish people. It was written to a group of Hebrews. Many of them were believers. Some of them, and maybe the majority, I don't know, but there was a significant number of these Hebrews who were questioning, who were wondering, struggling with putting their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. You remember that the, the main theme of Hebrews is that Jesus is superior. And so the writer of Hebrews begins by looking at the superiority of Christ to Moses and to all of the, the prophets, the various aspects of Jewish history and worship that they would have been most familiar with. When you and I grow up, we become familiar with things, and they sort of are imprinted into our minds as being the best things, the right things, the proper things. Maybe you remember when you got married that all of a sudden this person you're married to did something different. You didn't do it that way at your house. You did it the right way. <clears throat> now that we've all identified ourselves. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's just the way it is when we grow up. We grow up and we just accept what our experience is as the proper thing. And that's exactly what the recipients of this letter were coming to. I, I mean, that's what they grew up with. And for them to consider that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the, the culmination of everything in the Old Testament that they had been looking for in a Messiah, that was a challenge to them. And it is still a challenge to most Jewish people today. They're waiting for a Messiah. They're looking for a Messiah. We who know Jesus Christ as our Savior believe that He is the Messiah, that He is the one who has come, that He is the fulfillment of all of the things in the Old Testament. And that is exactly what the book of Hebrews is presenting to us. That Jesus, the Messiah, has come. That this Jesus who walked on this earth in the days of Pontius Pilate and Caesar Augustus and all the, as Luke locks it into history there, this same Jesus is in fact the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in chapter 11, we looked at 
a whole list of people that these Hebrews would have been familiar with. They were ones that were the, the heroes of the Jewish faith. They were the ones whom God had used in miraculous ways to accomplish his purpose in the past. <coughs> Hold on. Now I just should have stuck this in my mouth sooner. <laughs> they were the ones that, um, that were to be looked up to. Thank you, Rita. They were the ones that, that were the examples. You know, there is a tendency in all of us to think that because grandma and grandpa were believers or mom and dad were believers or a brother or our sister is a believer, that therefore we're going to be okay. The Jews put their faith in their Jewish heritage. Because I'm a child of Abraham, therefore I'm okay. That's kind of how the, the thought was. And today, and even here in this room, maybe some of you are thinking, well, you know, I'm a sixth or seventh or eighth generation person here at Branch Church. Of course I'm okay. I can trace my ancestry back a long way and we've got lots of Christians back there and in those generations that have gone and, and and therefore I'm okay well no that's not true that's not true all of us stand on our own individually before Almighty God it's a wonderful blessing if your parents your grandparents great 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 however many grandparents were believers that's wonderful you're the recipient of a marvelous heritage, but Jesus Christ is not yours until you knowingly, purposely put your faith in Christ for salvation. Until you come to that place, it's of no use. It's of no effect. And that's kind of the thrust of this letter to the Hebrews. You've got a wonderful heritage. But until you come to the place where you accept Jesus Christ as your Messiah, as your Savior, then it's of no value to you. In chapter 12, we kind of turn the corner, and it becomes very personal. Notice the word, therefore. All the things that have been said in chapter 11, and indeed in chapters 1 through 11, are being brought to bear here. Therefore, this is not some theoretical thing. This is not just a little bit of knowledge that you want to have in your head so that you can win on trivia someday. No, no. This has real life, real world, real time implications. Since you Hebrews have all this incredible heritage, all these incredible promises from God, since you have been the recipients of the law at Mount Sinai through Moses, since you've had all these blessings, you've had all this understanding of who the Messiah was going to be, and you of all people on the face of the earth have been chosen by Almighty God to have a personal relationship with Him. Therefore, in light of all this, do something about it. Do something about it. Don't waste the blessing, the privilege, the opportunity that you've been given. Do something about it. Therefore, since we also are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, it's, it's, that's an interesting phrase, this cloud of witnesses. It's the ordinary word for cloud, but most of the time in the Bible, it's used of a company, a group. And it's a big group. You know, you saw yesterday, and I'm, I'm sure you saw them just as we did uh, as we were traveling back home, huge clouds in the sky. I mean, weren't they beautiful? And oh my goodness, what a sunset. We were, 
we had just gotten out of Fredericksburg. We were on our way uh, up to Winchester, and the clouds were amazing, and the sunset was one of those that just surpasses description in its beauty and its majesty. We're used to seeing clouds, and they're big, and they're fluffy, and they take up a lot of space, and they attract our attention. But when we come to this word witnesses, we're thinking very 21st century English, an American idea. When we think of a witness, we think of someone who has observed something. And so when we think of a cloud of witnesses, and it, it's easy to do when it talks about the race that we're involved in, we're picturing, aren't we, kind of a stadium filled with people watching what's going on down there in the, in the main floor of the stadium. I'm not sure that that's really the picture that we ought to have. The word witness, and, and people will ask me from time to time, you know, can the dead see what I'm doing? Does this mean that, you know, my grandma and grandpa who are believers are up there watching me in my Christian life? Eh, I don't know. The Greek word martus, from which we get our word martyr, oh, now that's different, isn't it? That Greek word means one who has information or who has knowledge of something. And therefore, he's one who can give information or bring something to light. The idea here is not so much that you've got a, people, a group of people who are watching but rather, you've got a group of people who are bringing something to light. They're bringing to light with their lives. They're bringing to a place of, of display and of evidence the reality of faith. We're surrounded by them. I mean, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, all that great list the, their, their lives bring to light the importance of faith and the importance of persistence in faith. I, I think that's probably the best way to understand this. Whether those who have gone to be with the Lord uh, are, are, are watching and cheering us on, I, I don't know. I don't think you can prove it from this verse. I think what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, look, we stand in line with all of these great saints of the past whose lives, whose actions, whose words have demonstrated to us the value and the importance of living by faith. You remember that from early in Hebrews? The just shall live by faith. Quoted in Hebrews, quoted in Romans, quoted in Galatians. They give testimony. And that testimony that that huge cloud of martyrs, of testifiers, gives should have an impact on my life. They become examples to me as to how to live, how to live by faith, how to go forward each day in the power and the strength of Almighty God. And here's how we do it. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. And let us run the race. I, I understand why we get that image of a, you know, a stadium filled with people watching runners in a race. But I think the other way of looking at it is probably a, a better and a little more accurate way of thinking about it. We've got our race. And you know, runners in the ancient world, in the Greek world, they ran very differently from the way runners do today. Most of the time, those Olympic athletes competed, competed in the nude. 
they didn't wear anything because they didn't want anything to be a hindrance to them. That's certainly a difference in culture and a difference in time. But the writer of Hebrews draws on that concept. We've got to lay aside the weights. Now the difference between weight and sin is important. A weight we might think of as something that gets in our way that slows us down but it's not necessarily bad okay so for example if, if somebody wants to go out and run a race this afternoon and they wear long pants can they run in a race yeah will long pants maybe slow them down a little bit yeah would shorts be better to run a race in well yeah because they're not going to slow you down quite as much the weight is not necessarily something that is wrong morally but it gets in our way what is it that gets in our way in our pursuit of Jesus Christ what is it that gets in our way it's it's maybe not terribly wrong it it it, it may not be wrong at all but it's not the best thing you know that's the most difficult choice for us to make isn't it between two apparent goods this thing is good, this thing is good. Nothing wrong with either one. Which one should we choose? Well, maybe one will weigh us down a little bit more in this life than the other will. Maybe, maybe it's the difference between a weight and a wing. You know, some things weigh us down. Some things enable us to fly. Let's choose those things that enable us to fly rather than weigh us down, that distract us from the race that is before us. Did you ever watch somebody run a race and they're always looking back behind them to see where everybody else is? The weight there that's slowing them down is their concern for everybody else behind them. Are they catching up to me? Are they going to pass me? Don't worry about that. Fix your eye on the goal and run and run like the wind. Give it your best shot. Don't worry what everybody else is doing. Have you noticed the Olympic athletes? They don't turn around and look, do they? Now, they might be curious about, you know, who's gaining on them, who's behind them, and so forth, but they don't look because they've disciplined themselves. To look would be a weight. And it would slow them down. What is it that slows us down in our pursuit of Jesus Christ? And the sin. Now that's an easy one, isn't it? I mean, sin is some moral failure. We need to lay aside those sins. And, and don't think that we're not susceptible to sin. We're always susceptible to moral failure. There's temptations all around. There's temptations even from within us. In fact, it's the temptation from within that makes the temptation from without so dangerous. If I go fishing and the fish are looking for worms and I put worms on the hook, I'm liable to get a fish. But if I go fishing and the the fish are looking for those little skimmer things that you know are on the top of the water. I can soak worms all day long and I'm not going to get anything because it's not enticing to the fish. The sin that we have to deal with is what's enticing to us on the inside. And we need to lay those things aside. We need to be aware of those things and put them away. Put them away. Let us Lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. The word that's used here is an interesting word. And if you look at the different translations, you see it's expressed in different ways. It literally means to stand around well. So that if I had one of you come up here this morning and stand in the middle, and then five or six or seven of us come up and stand around, around you, close to you, you'd get the idea. 
it surrounds us. It's right there. It's ever-present. That sin which surrounds us really well, but it's really dangerous. There's always opportunity for sin and always opportunity for all kinds of sin. You know, we think of sins in categories, don't we? We think of big sins and little sins and little white lies and black lies, and we, we come up with all kinds of things. This is just the general word for sin, the general word for a moral failure, a general word for something that displeases God. And they, they surround us. They easily beset us. We need to run with endurance. Notice it says, let us run with endurance. The old word that you don't hear much about anymore is perseverance. You don't quit. It's too easy to quit in life, isn't it? You know, we live in the cancel culture age, I guess, and if you don't like something, you just quit it. You cancel it. You blot it out. You, you don't deal with it. You just erase it. When the going gets tough, Nobody goes anymore. <laughs> you just abandon ship. We don't know what endurance is. We don't know what perseverance is. We come into a little bit of a hardship, and oh, woe is me. We've, we feel like victims. Oh, this is really hard. This shouldn't be hard. Well, welcome to life. Life is hard. Life comes at us at 100 miles an hour, and sometimes it's enjoyable, and a lot of times it's disappointing. And, and if, you, if you stop at every little bump in the road, you're never going to make any progress. If I wanted to run a marathon, and I started training for that marathon, and, and I got to the point where, you know, I got a little hungry for ice cream, and I thought, oh, man, you know, they're having ice cream tonight at church. And, and I, I want to run this race, but, you know, I, I just really want ice cream. So, all right, well, later. I'm going to have ice cream. I'll never run the race, will I? It'll never happen. We need to persevere. We need to endure. We need to push through the hardships. We need to push through the trials. That's the only way that we're going to run a race. And that's the only way that guys like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the great heroes of the faith in chapter 11, yeah, they fell down. Yes, they, they failed. from, t But they got up and they kept running. They persevered. They endured. They pressed on. We tend not to press on. We, we've bought into this health and wealth gospel idea that God wants everybody healthy and happy. And that your greatest good is right here in this life. And, and when something is hard, when something calls us to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Christ, well, we abandon that quickly because it's not comfortable. We need perseverance. We need to endure. Notice that this is the race that is set before us. Every year, the uh, Franklin County cyclists come uh, in early part of July, and oh my goodness, there'll be 150, 200 bus, uh, cyclists out here. And they have, a, it's not a race, but it's a course. And the course is set out, and there's markers along the way. A and somebody comes, and they map all that out. And they pass out the instructions, and they say, here are the markers, and then the, the group takes off. Now, for some of us, it's a race. For some of them, it's a race. And for others, it's just a, an enjoyable ride. But it's a course marked out for them by someone else. This course of life that you and I have, this course of the Christian life, is one that is set before us. It's one that's marked out for us. And the one who has marked it out for us is our Heavenly Father. He has chosen the course. He has chosen the hills, 
the valleys. He's chosen those things for us and for our good. And so when I'm running my race and it's uphill, God wants it to be uphill for purposes, for reasons. When I'm running my race and it's over rough and rocky and difficult terrain, God wants it to be over rough and rocky and difficult terrain because he's doing something with it. When it's downhill, when it's flat and smooth and level, those things too are from my Heavenly Father. He has marked out my course and I need to run it, I need to endure, and I need to run with the intention of winning the race. Now, each one of us has a different course because each one of us is a little bit different. And God is using the ex experiences of life, He's using the things of this life to equip us and prepare us and shape us and mold us into the imitation of His Son. Jesus ran a race when he was on this earth, didn't he? I, I don't mean like a marathon, but he had a course marked out for him. It was from the cradle to the cross to the empty tomb back to heaven and the throne of God. And Jesus needed a little endurance. He needed a little grit to be able to run that race. But every event, every twist, every turn, every up, every down in that race was marked out for him by the Heavenly Father. And Jesus ran his race. And he accomplished God's purpose. And we are the beneficiaries of that race. Jesus is our pattern, isn't he? There in chapter 12, the first part of the verse. It says, looking, looking unto Jesus. The word look there means to stare at, to gaze. In other words, this, this thing that we're looking at just captures all of our attention. It's the only thing that we're seeing. It was tough last night driving home and trying to watch the road, and get a glance of that sunset every once in a while, you know? And it was gorgeous. And had there been room, I would have pulled over and we would have sat there and watched it for a little while because it kept changing, it kept shifting, the clouds were moving and so forth, and of course the sun was going down and the angle was always changing, and it was beautiful gold, and then it was orange, and then it was red, and then it was purple, and it was just fantastic. It captured my gaze. Does Jesus capture your gaze? Do you know Jesus? Have you considered Jesus well enough that you are just absolutely captivated by him? I think most of us know a little bit about Jesus. And it's like, yeah, he died for me. He died for my sins. He's promised me heaven. That's great. Did you ever consider how Jesus might have felt when his own family members came to take him away because they thought he was a little mentally unbalanced? I mean, he's proclaiming himself to be the Messiah, the Son of God. We, we need to go get him and, and kind of get him away from the crowd and talk sense into him. How would Jesus have felt? How would you feel <laughs> if your family members came to you and said, I think you're a little couple bricks short of a full load. Let's, let's come over here and talk about things. That would hurt, wouldn't it? And other things in Christ's life, things that he experienced 
that you and I have experienced. You know, most biblical scholars believe that uh, Joseph, his foster father, had died by the time Jesus' public ministry began. So he knows what it's like, for all intents and purposes, to bury a parent. He knows what loss is like. He, he knows what it's like to be ridiculed. And all of those things. Consider Jesus. Look unto Jesus. Look at him. Think about him. Read what's in the, the Gospels. In, in your sanctified imagination, think about the implications of what you're reading. How would Jesus have felt as a human being, and he was 100% human, wasn't he? Yes, he was. How do you feel when someone hates you and attacks you with all kinds of unkind and even untrue statements? Jesus experienced that. So when you experience that, do you think you have somebody that can understand what you're going through? Absolutely. Looking unto Jesus. Notice, it says, this is amazing. He is the author and finisher. The word author there and the word finisher are both, this is the only time they appear in the New Testament. They're unique words. The word author there, we can also express as the file leader. He's, he's the guy on the military squad who's leading the squad and he's out front and the other guys are behind him. He's the point man. He's the one that's going ahead of everybody else and everybody is following him. He's the author. He's, he's the initiator. He's the file leader. Jesus is the one who has lived a perfect life of faith as a human being. He had to have faith that God the Father was actually going to do what he said he would do in raising his son from the dead. He had to have faith in that. He had to believe that what the Father said in, in all of his promises, that, that he'd fulfill it. Do you and I have to believe the promises of God? Yes. And in his humanity, so did Jesus Christ. He has set the example. He has gone before. He is leading the way. He's the one that has gone out there ahead of us. And the word finisher, it's another unique word, it means the completer. He, he did it. He completed the race. He's the one who started it, and he's the one who finished it. And that's the one that we're to be looking to. We're to be watching him. We're to be imitating him. He is the, the author, the finisher. Now, if your Bible's like mine, and I hope it is, you notice the little word our there? It's in italics. The translators are trying to help us. And they're looking at the context and they're saying, okay, th this is all being written to people who are believers, and so it's our faith. The word our is not there in the original language. And I don't think the word our should be put there. He is the author and finisher of the faith. This is faith in its objective truth that God can be trusted and that to please God, we need to trust God. That's the, the, the concept of faith is to believe God, to take God at his word, to trust him and to act upon the promises of God which are trustworthy. That's faith. That's what Jesus did. He is the, the point man, he is the author, he is the file leader, and he is the completer. He finished the job. He trusted God to the very end. 
and he laid down his life, and he was raised from the dead. He's the completer of faith. Notice also, it says, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. This is his perspective, should be our perspective, for the joy set before him. You and I are part of that joy. We don't have time to look at it, but in Isaiah chapter 53, it says that he will see his suffering and be satisfied. Why? Because it is through that suffering that Jesus leads many sons to glory. It's worth it. It's worth it. You are worth it. Maybe you've seen these signs that are popping up in Franklin County that tell us that you matter. And that's the secular world's view of trying to tell you that you're important and making you feel good about yourself. You want to know how important you are? Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. And he rose again from the dead for your justification. It doesn't get any better than that. You don't matter to the world. The world despises you. The world hates you. The world hates itself because the world is separated from God. It doesn't matter what the world says. What matters is what God says. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he did it not generally, he did it specifically for you, for those who are created in God's image, who are sinners, separated from God, but whom God is willing to forgive and to receive back to himself. That's, <laughs> that's important. That brings Jesus Christ joy. And he will rejoice over us and we will rejoice in him forever. Forever. It also shows that Jesus, even in his humanity, took the long-term eternal perspective on life. He was a human being. Do you remember the, the Garden of Gethsemane? Where he, in his humanity, cries out and he says, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. When Jesus came to this earth and he came as a fully human being, he didn't think, oh boy, one of these days I'm going to get to be spat upon. They're, they're going to beat me. They're going to stick a crown of thorns on my head. They're going to nail me to the cross. I can't wait. Sounds like fun. That was not the perspective. Jesus did not look forward to suffering. None of us do. But he had the eternal perspective that this suffering would result in glory to God, would result in the salvation of souls, would result in eternal blessing to all those who would eventually come to him. You see, beloved, there's a pattern there for us. There's an example for us. If you and I look at this life and we say, the purpose of this life is for me to have a good time, for me to enjoy myself now, then anything that disrupts our good time and our personal enjoyment is looked upon as a tragedy. We get angry about it, and, and, and there we are, frustrated with a short-term view of life. No wonder so many people are so angry. 
because they're trying to get out of this life what God intends for us to enjoy in eternity. But if we can take the eternal view that the problems, the trials, the struggles, the disasters of this life are all part of that race that is set before us by our Heavenly Father and that He is using all of those things to move us toward even more Christ-likeness because Christ suffered, you know. That suffering was valuable to Him and to us moving us toward eternity when we get to eternity, then we can enjoy the blessings and the benefits of all that we have suffered and endured in this life. Do we have the eternal perspective or are we thinking that it ought to happen right now? I hope you're not a follower of Joel Osteen because he wants us to believe that it all has to be good right now. Scripture wants us to understand that whether it's pleasant or unpleasant now, if you know Christ is your Savior, if you're growing, you're enduring, you're persevering, you're walking day by day by day by faith and obedience to Christ, you've got a future that is so incredible there are not words to describe it. Don't focus on the here and now focus on the joy set before us. What's our struggle? Well, notice verse 3, consider him. This is interesting. This word consider means to, to focus the mind on. If, if looking to Jesus is focusing our eyes on, considering is focusing our mind on. Let those thoughts occupy your, th your thinking. Consider, it says, him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Discouragement is more dangerous than a major catastrophe. Because when you're discouraged, even a little thing will knock you down. When your soul is discouraged, even something small will come along and will lay you low. Somebody once said that, uh, I read this years ago, Satan decided he was going to get out of the tempting business. Obviously, this is an apocryphal story. And he put up for for auction all of his tools and so there was lust and greed and pride and avarice and money and all these things and all of those were sold and over there in the corner was a little tool it was like a wedge and it was not very impressive at first but you could tell that it was well used and somebody asks Satan what's what's that over there and he says oh that's my greatest and most effective tool the one that I've used most frequently it's called discouragement we've all been there haven't we when we've been discouraged in our walk with Christ things haven't maybe met up to our expectations and and, and we want to give up we're discouraged we're down Beloved, that's when we need to look to Jesus. And on a practical basis, that's where we need to encourage one another. That's why God has given you and me to one another so that we can come alongside those who are hurting, come alongside those who are suffering and struggling and discouraged, and we can encourage them, not with some cheap platitude, but with our prayers, with our presence, and with our compassion and our concern. We may not be able to fix a circumstance, but we can let somebody know that they're not alone and that discouragement is not something that's going to be permanent, that God is in heaven. And though right now 
the way is through the valley. And right now, the way is through the hard places and the rough and the rocky and the unsecure places. That's not the end of the race. There's still more race to be run. And there's still more that God is doing. And we can share what God has done in our lives. And we can help each other. If we are absent from one another, we can't enjoy that blessing. But if we are here together, we can benefit from that blessing of mutual encouragement and strength. Consider Him who endured Look to Jesus. Let Him capture your vision. Let Him capture your thinking. Look to Jesus. You've got all these examples, all this cloud of, of testifiers that are listed in Hebrews 11. They did it. They were men and women just like you and I. They stumbled. They fell, but they still kept their eyes on God. They kept their eyes on the promises of God, and they got back up and they kept moving. We can do the same because the same Spirit of God who worked in their lives is working in your life now. And He will complete that good work. Paul says it to the believers in Philippi. He who began a good work in you will complete it till the day of Christ Jesus. So what's our lessons for today? Beloved, you and I are in a spiritual battle. We're in a spiritual battle. Satan wants to distract us. He wants to discourage us. He wants to deflect us off away from the path that God has marked out for us. We're involved in a spiritual battle. Put on the armor of God. Go read Ephesians 6 this afternoon. Put on the, take advantage of the armor of God. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Let your mind and your heart be captivated by him. He is the perfect example. He's been where you are. And he succeeded. He trusted God in his humanity. He overcame. And get the eternal perspective. When we're in the middle of a struggle and it's been long and we've been waiting and waiting and nothing's happening, it's easy to give up. But beloved, here's where we can help each other to keep that eternal perspective in mind. This moment is not the end. Something greater is coming. And then finally, we have a supernatural source of strength. As a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God dwells within you. He dwells within me. And the Spirit of God is jealous for the children of God. The Spirit of God desires for us to grow in our, in our understanding of the Word and in our dependence upon the Word. The Spirit of God is moving within us, drawing us along. We are not walking this path. We are not running this race alone. We have a supernatural strength. We have the Word of God. We have the examples of godly people around us. Oh, beloved, God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Let's take advantage of that. Let's run that race with our eyes fixed on Christ and run like we intend to win. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. So much to think about. And Lord, it gets a little weary from time to time. And the world is always distracting us. And even in our own hearts and minds, it's easy for us to give up and become discouraged and want to quit. But Lord, that's not what you want for your children. You have so much better in mind. Father, for those that are here today 
and they are struggling and hurting and feel like they're about to go down for the last time, rescue them, Father. Pick them up. Fill them with your Spirit. They're too weak to walk on their own, so Lord, carry them for a while. Help them to regain strength. Give them a new vision of yourself. Help them to see with eyes of faith the great future that's laid up in store for us. Heavenly Father, there are those here today that really are, are walking with strength in the Lord. They're walking with joy. and Father, help them to see the needs of those around them and to remember the time when they were struggling and hurting. And Father, help us to be able to share with one another the truth and the strength that we need. Build your church, Lord. Strengthen your people. Help us to run this race with our eyes fixed on Christ for the joy that's set before us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.